Apparently, evolutionists have a holy book that you can't question. Apparently, mainstream science has sacred ideas, perhaps not engraved in stone, but in ink on paper, that define the rightness or wrongness of a scientific idea. Welcome to Traced, Human DNA's Big Surprise. This is Answering the Critics. My name is Nathaniel Jeanson, the research biologist here at Answers in Genesis. And I promise you this session is going to be a doozy. We've been looking at the data and the revolutionary discoveries in this new book, Traced, Human DNA's Big Surprise. The last few sessions, and I'll tell you how you can find more in this series in a moment, but the last few sessions we've been looking at the science behind Traced. And now finally we get, as promised, to the session where we begin to answer the, the, the critics, and, and they've, they've given creation science a tremendous gift that resets the creation evolution debate, and I'm really excited to tell you about this. I'm, I'm titling this The Quiet Revolution, How Young Earth Science is Pushing Back Four Decades of Criticism, and by the way, this is part 16 then if you've been following the series, and I've titled this, this is essentially my thesis, and this entire talk is going to be walking through this thesis phrase by phrase, word by word, so that by the end of it, you know exactly what I'm talking about. So let's dive right in. Beginning with the word revolution. Why would I say this is a quiet revolution? Number one, because for these ideas to gain mainstream traction, a revolution is required. The Pew Forum has been surveying members of the professional scientific community for years. This is a 2015 survey, the AAAS up here at the top of the screen. Uh, that's the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and among working PhD scientists, 99% of them hold to the evolutionary view that humans and other living things have evolved over time. This has been a standard survey question for years, and what's typically considered the creationist answer is affirmed by 1%, maybe even less, of professional scientists. So number one, it would take a revolution for the ideas in Traced to gain enough traction for people to accept this in the mainstream. Secondly, there's a bit of history that's relevant here that for whatever reason has been lost in the Western scientific establishment and in the Western popular thought. What I want to show you is that revolutions are normal and we're at the current state in terms of the professional view of evolution because of an earlier revolution. So pay attention to the dates real fast. That's the main thing I want you to see in these next few slides. Darwin wrote his book in 1859, and in that first edition, he anticipated the criticisms of those who were opposed to his ideas. And in the closing chapter, he rhetorically asked this, why it may be asked, have all the most eminent living naturalists and geologists rejected this view of the mutability of species? So Darwin recognized, he admitted, 1859, he is going against the mainstream scientific consensus of his day. What's interesting is if you look towards a later edition, so the 1869 edition, which is the fifth edition, that sentence changes on the screen right now is the 1859 version. By 1869, just 10 years later, he said, why it may be asked until recently, did nearly all the most eminent living naturalists and geologists reject this view of the mutability of species. So within a decade, Darwin challenged the scientific consensus and flipped it to his favor. Revolutions can occur quickly and with little warning, and our entire scientific edifice is based on a revolution from 150 years ago. So that's the first word, the quiet revolution. Revolutions are a normal part of the scientific process. Secondly now, the second phrase we want to look at is four decades of criticism, how young earth science is pushing back against four decades of criticism. What am I talking about? I'm going to show you just a few quotes for sake of time over the period of several decades to show you there's been a consistent response of the mainstream scientific community to young earth creationist ideas, which is what Traced is based on and what the book Traced advances. 1982 was a, a landmark federal court decision that laid the foundation for an eventual Supreme Court decision in the United States in 1987. In 1982, the parties opposed to one another 
or I should say the law, on the books that was in question was one in Arkansas that mandated the teaching of creation science alongside evolution, and this was brought into the courtroom. The judge overruled the law, said it was, you couldn't do that. You couldn't teach creation science in the scientific classroom. And this is what he said. This was his justification. He said the creationists' methods do not take data, weigh it against the opposing scientific data, and thereafter reach the conclusions. While anybody is free to approach a scientific inquiry in any fashion they choose, they cannot properly describe the methodology used as scientific if they start with a conclusion and refuse to change it regardless of the evidence developed during the course of the investigation. Essentially what the judge was saying was that creationists fit facts to predetermined conclusions instead of letting facts mold and shape and change conclusions as new data comes in. Here's a quote from 95, Douglas Fatuma, a, a long-standing anti-creationist. He wrote a book, Science on Trial, The Case for Evolution. And he said the creationists are assaulting the entire mode of scientific thought and the guiding principle of science, that traditional beliefs are open to skeptical inquiry. So Fatuma is saying that science is based on questioning essentially everything, that there are no sacred conclusions that we cannot evaluate by testing and experimentation. He says, the fact is, in the scientific sense, there can be no evidence for supernatural special creation. Belief in special creation must rest on faith and on the authority of the Bible and its most literal interpreters. The fundamental conflict, then, is between two incompatible ways to knowledge. Science emphasizes evidence and logical deduction and is forever uncertain. It deals not with irrefutable facts engraved on stone tablets, which of course he's referencing the Ten Commandments there, but with hypotheses that may be refuted by tomorrow's experiments and concepts formulated by fallible human minds. The best scientific education encourages skepticism, questioning, independent thought, and the use of reason. And if you were listening carefully to that quote, you may have detected this sense that evolutionists in the mainstream community have viewed creation science not just as pseudoscience, You've probably heard that if you've been in the creation evolution debate for any length of time, but they're viewing it as anti-science. Here's another quote, 2017, so hopefully you can see there's been a consistent pattern here over several decades. Indeed, much of science consists of seeking chinks in the armor of established ideas. Thus, science as a social process is tentative. It questions belief and authority. It continually tests its views against evidence. Science differs in this way from creationism, which does not use evidence to test its claims, does not allow evidence to shake its a priori commitment to certain beliefs, and does not grow in its capacity to explain the natural world. So there you have it again, just briefly for sake of time, but a strong anti-scientific accusation from the mainstream community against creation science. Critics of creation science have cast creationism as dogmatic, inflexible, unchangeable, untestable, and not just unscientific, but against science itself. And I want to add a, a, another element of nuance and detail here. What they've said in technical, technical language, and this is key for understanding what, what just happened in the last uh, calendar year, basically, from the scientific community in response to trace. This is what they mean when they say it's cre that creation science is anti-science. This is the specific te technical manifestation that it appears in. The essential characteristics of science are, this is the judge again from this 1982 court decision, where he said creation science cannot be taught in the scientific classroom because he says it's, it's not science. And science is defined by, he gives five characteristics. The one I want to hone in on here is this not point number five, that science is falsifiable, and he goes on, of course, to say creation science fails to meet these essential characteristics. I'll explain that word falsifiable here in a moment. Another quote from another anti-creationist book written by a fairly well-known paleontologist, Niles Eldridge, his colleague in paleontology, Stephen Jay Gould, you might have heard of if you didn't hear of Eldridge, but he was well-known in his day as well. So he wrote a book called The Monkey Business, A Scientist Looks at Creationism. He says creation science isn't science at all, nor have creation scientists managed to come up with even a single intellectually compelling, and here's the key phrase, scientifically testable statement about the natural world. 
And one last quote again to show you that this technical manifestation is consistent, has been consistent for decades. Back to Fatuma, and I, I forgot to mention he's got a co-author now on his, on his evolution textbook from 2017, fourth edition. They say in their chapter dealing with creation science, the most important feature of scientific hypotheses is that they are testable. My favorite example is gravity. Gravity is testable. I'm holding this water bottle half full in my hand. I'm here on Earth in Kentucky sitting in my office, and the laws of gravity for this place predict that when I release my grip on this bottle, it's going to fall. Of course it does. We can do this over and over again. You can test gravity where you're sitting by picking up a heavy object, seeing if it falls, if it starts levitating, then you have reason to question gravity. So even though we accept gravity as fact, it is still considered scientific because it's still in theory and in practice possible to test and, and potentially falsify gravity if we find a result that's inconsistent with it. Of course, we keep testing gravity, it keeps working so it, it's established as a, a well-supported scientific idea. The evolutionists, the mainstream community, have said creation science is anti-scientific and specifically because it does not make testable or falsifiable predictions. In theory, I can falsify gravity with my little water bottle experiment. You can, in theory, falsify gravity. So those are the, that's, that's the four decades of criticism. There's been a consistent pattern this is what's been said over and over again in the popular literature, in textbooks, even in court decisions. So how is creation science pushing back against these four decades? If you've been watching the series, you've already seen five episodes, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Again, if you go to our YouTube channel, Answers in Genesis YouTube channel, we have a playlist, Traced Human DNA's Big Surprise. This is what I was referring to a few minutes ago when I said if you've been following the series, this is not part 16. I'm showing down here through 14. 15 will be up there as well. You've already seen a large amount of evidence, and more importantly, the progress of predictions and fulfillments. Predictions, testing, and fulfillments. Banging my microphone here because I'm excited. <laughs> This has been done now over the past decade. And just to just for sake of review, because this is so relevant now at this juncture, how is creation science pushing back by making testable predictions? And the one that's perhaps the most relevant for this book, Traced, Human DNA's Big Surprise, is one I made five years ago, October 2017. I said, and I'll, I'll read this lengthy quote and then explain it. I said, my model, which I, I was talking about the larger question of the origin of species, but specifically then about the origin of humans, my model suggests that the history of civilization can be read off the nuclear DNA differences, that's just a certain type of DNA in your cells, among the peoples of the globe and on a time scale consistent with the Young Earth model, YEC Young Earth Creation model. And again, this is not something that's unique to me. Any creationist can make this derivation. If what the Bible says is true, that God created Adam and Eve, they had offspring, they went corrupt, God decides to destroy the planet and saves only eight people, Noah, his wife, his sons, and their wives. And therefore, God destroys all the pre-flood civilizations in the flood. And that humanity restarts on a wiped clean earth about 4,500 years ago. Then we would expect to find the, Egyptian, the, the, the genetic signatures of the Egyptian civilization, the Roman civilization, the Greek civilization, Genghis Khan's empire, and so on and so forth all throughout our DNA. It's a very different expectation from evolution because their time scale is so much longer and human history is just the tail tip end of an extremely long evolutionary time scale. In contrast, the Young Earth time scale says the entirety of the post-flood time scale, 4,500 years, records the history of civilization. And I said specifically the male inherited DNA, the Y chromosome differences among modern humans represents the first type of nuclear DNA signature, which, again, if you've been following the series, you know this has been the focus of TRACE for technical reasons. Uh, there's just a lot of statistical noise in the female inherited DNA that makes it difficult. I would love to be able to use it, but everyone is stuck because of the noise. The Y chromosome, the male inherited DNA, has much less statistical noise, and we've been able to infer a lot. Now, the prediction was, can we see the echo of the history of civilization in our DNA? Step one in trying to test and answer this 
looking at the male inherited DNA, the, DNA, the Y chromosome, is to see how fast or slow this DNA changes. How fast does it mutate every generation? Or maybe it's slow, maybe it's every 10, 20, 50 generations that this Y chromosome is passed on from fathers to sons and passed on imperfectly. Well, the first studies that were published attempting to do this seem to fit the evolutionary timescale. It seemed that the rate at which the Y chromosome was mutated, that the father passed on imperfect versions of it to their sons, that it was slow. That was in 2009. One of the first published studies came out by 2017. I was aware of four of them. And again, this is stuff I've covered in, in, in previous episodes. I'm just going to review it briefly. Two of these studies were high coverage, or that's just a technical term for high quality. Two were low coverage. I published the technical details in a paper in 2019. Long story short, these two studies, which were low coverage, low quality, gave you a slow mutation rate. These two studies that were high coverage, high quality, gave a high mutation rate. Again, I'm going over this quickly because I've covered this before. And what's so shocking is that the evolutionists, again, these are not my studies. I've, I've summarized and analyzed this in my own paper. But the raw data comes from the evolutionary literature, and these authors are aware of the data. And so what did they do with a study that seemed to contradict evolution? They literally filtered out data that didn't match. And if you don't believe me, again, I've got the details in this paper. I've reviewed it somewhat in the videos, and I'll just give you a quote from this paper. If you go to the supplemental methods, FS here, they define as father-son differences. The number of father-son differences was approximately tenfold higher than the expected number of de novo mutations, considering the range of published Y chromosome mutation rates. So they're saying we expected something a lot slower, and they're citing a low quality study. This finding prompted us to explore additional filters. Truth is stranger than fiction. Okay, what have the critics said? Well, one of the things that the critics have brought up is, well, what if we say for sake of argument, yes, that the mutation rate is fast. How do you know that this fast rate of mutation, which by the way, on average is about three mutations per generation, well, that's what has been measured so far, how do we know that this has been consistent throughout human history? Maybe it was slower in times past. Maybe natural selection eliminates certain variants, so effectively the rate is a lot slower than if you just look in a, in a single generation time span from one generation to the next. We can test that. That's been tested. You can look at the history of human population growth. I'm not going to spend time on the details, but long story short, with the young earth time scale, that we, we can, number one, create a family tree for global humanity based on the Y chromosome DNA. That family tree records the history of population growth. And when you look at the history of population growth saying, well, what if this is 4,500 years old, this whole tree, there's a match. That's, that's the bottom line. There's a tremendous match, or I should say, we've tested the hypothesis that the rate of it has been consistent, and it strongly confirms that hypothesis. And this is a second paper I published in 2019 testing the predictions of the young Earth Y chromosome level of a clock. This captured the global history of human population growth. These are, and again, the initial steps to see if we can find the history of civilization. And I should say, this finding, this match right here, that is one major element of the history of civilization. How humanity, the human, human population sizes have risen and fallen. It's, it's basically a hockey stick shaped curve. And we can, we can see that hockey stick shape in the DNA extremely strongly with a 4,500 year time scale. It matches well. Let me stop for a minute and let's, let's step back and think about what should happen next if creation science is science. Well, these findings should never be the end of the story. They should make new predictions. So this global data predicts we should see regional matches between the DNA and the known history of human population rises and falls in a specific region. That was another paper, 2020, looking at the pre-Columbian and post-Columbian history of the Americas. If you've read the book Traced, you know that in, uh, I think in one of the appendices, I talk about data I didn't have in 2019 or 2020 when these papers came out, North African data. So here's another region where I could test the predictions. We know the history, for example, in this case of Nigeria, and there was data published for the Mozabites, an, an Algerian population. And there's again, this is from the one of the color plates in the book Traced. There's again a tremendous match here. There's also data in the book talking about the Middle East. 
great, more fulfilled predictions. And if you're following this train of thought, you should know that again, that, that the next question should be, what else does this predict? You never stop there, you just keep going. Well, to summarize then, the father-son mutation rate predicted global population growth curve matches to the Y chromosome data, which predicted regional matches. So the father-son mutation rate fit the young Earth time scale. It predicted this, that was fulfilled. It predicted this, which predict that we should see the history of civilization in the Y chromosome tree. And that is essentially the central thesis of the book trace that we can see it all over the family tree. That's 2022. We saw the prediction there. And uh, I've, I've mentioned this in the previous videos, I think. In the process of finding the history of civilization, we also found, to my surprise and delight, the echo, the genetic echo of the Genesis 10 male family tree. If you know your Bible, you know that Genesis 10 records the male descendants of Shem, Ham, and Japheth, the three sons of Noah, and there's differences in the lengths of those family trees before Babel happens and people disperse. All that to say, long story short, you can see that. You can count off the generations. You can see here's Shem and his son Arphaxad, and here's a descendant Eber, and, and so on. And this is not the end. We're still making predictions. One of the strongest predictions that's guiding research going forward, where the rubber really meets the road, is being able to predict where in the globe we'll find new branches, where on the tree those branches will fall, and how many men you have to sample to find them. Those are three precise technical elements of this model that make predictions to this day. And I'm still testing them. So again, this is the book that I referred to. Some of this backstory, again, you can find on this, uh, on the Answers in Genesis YouTube channel, the Traced DNA's Big Surprise playlist. I went through this quickly because it's review, but I wanted you to see again, creation science has pushed back against four decades of criticism by making and fulfilling and making and fulfilling and still making testable predictions. So if you, the research is ongoing. We haven't stopped. If you want to participate in future research, go to ancestorsgenesis.org slash go slash traced. That's the title of the book. You'll find a button right here that you can click on or you can just scroll down. You'll find a place to enter your name, email. I think now we've got a phone number element up there, box you can enter. Critics of creation science for decades have demanded that creation scientists produce testable predictions by which we can, they could in theory falsify creation science and creation science has met that standard and far exceeded it. And those, the reason we've done five videos giving the backstory is to show you there's a decade-long pattern of this. That's spectacular. But the point of this talk is to analyze how the critics have responded. And that brings us to the, to the final element of this thesis, the quiet revolution, how young earth science is pushing back four decades of criticism. Why is this a quiet revolution? Well, think about another element of this standard for science that we've been reflecting on. Testable predictions. By their nature, testable predictions are dangerous. Why? Because anyone who makes them puts their credibility on the line. In other words, you make a testable prediction. I make a testable prediction. I'm giving evolutionists the rope by which to hang my ideas. I'm saying, I predict this. And what I predict might be wrong. Now, you'd think the evolutionary community would be beside themselves with joy that there are these testable predictions now in print, that they could knock themselves out doing experiment after experiment after experiment, refuting experimentally what creation scientists have said. So what do you think they've done? If if you don't believe what I'm about to say, you can look it up yourself. Daniel Cardinal, Herman Mays, and Joel Duff are the main professionals, scientific professionals, who've responded. And we're going to get into some of the details of what they've done here in a moment. Well, I'm going to focus here on Daniel Cardinal. He's a virologist at Rutgers. Herman Mays is an evolutionary biologist at Marshall. If you've been following my work, you know I did a debate with him on my book, Replacing Darwin, several years ago. Joel Duff is a professing Christian and a professor of biologist at Akron in Ohio. I want to focus on what Cardinal says because 
his critique has some of the most points, most detail, covers a lot of the ground that the other guys do. So his critique is a, is a, is a great one stop for understanding how the mainstream community has responded to this work. And I want to focus on one point that Cardinal made several times. So you can see here, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm giving you a screenshot from his video, YouTube video, book review traced by me, of course, and that there's, there's Daniel himself presenting this. You'll notice up here the big problem. So that's his own words. He's saying, here's the big problem with my work. And I'll show you, he repeats this same point under other subheadings. He's got about six. I'm banging my microphone again because I'm excited. He says, the big problem, my simple error, is conflating genealogy with phylogeny. If you don't know if those terms are foreign to you, he's essentially saying, I've taken the father-son mutation rate, genealogy, and extrapolated it into the past, assuming it's been constant. That's the phylogeny part. And he cites a textbook. Now you might say, whoa, 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 whoa. Didn't you already address that point? Well, yes. Yes, I did three years ago. And number one, he doesn't seem to be aware this even exists. Number two, and here's the bigger point. This is the bombshell. What is his justification? That's a textbook reference. He's saying it's wrong. What I'm doing is wrong because it disagrees with the textbook. Apparently, evolutionists have a holy book that you can't question. Apparently, mainstream science has sacred ideas, perhaps not engraved in stone, but in ink on paper, that define the rightness or wrongness of a scientific idea. You would think the textbook itself, if it was scientific, would be open to testing falsifiability, and everything else that defines science. But not according to Dr. Dan, which again, he, these are the leading people responding to what I'm saying, and the big problem, his words, <laughs> is that I'm conflating genealogy and phylogeny, and the textbook says otherwise. Amazing. Evolutionists, by their own behavior, have a religion. And you can't question that religion. You can't do science in disagreement with that religion. And just to show you, he's, he's camping out on this point, point number four of his critique, overlaying phylogeny and pedigree. Same thing again. Pedigree is the father-son. Same I extrapolate in times past. <laughs> he says, you can't do that. It's just astonishing, mind-boggling. You can't apparently question the textbook or do experiments to evaluate experimentally what the textbook says. So let me ask you a question, you the viewer. Which of the two camps, young earth creationists or evolutionists, are the ones who refuse to take data and weigh it against opposing scientific data and thereafter reach the conclusions? Which of these two camps is the one that claims to be doing science but starts with a conclusion and refuses, it, refuses to change it regardless of the evidence developed in the course of the investigation. Which of these two views, creation science or evolution, are assaulting the entire mode of scientific thought and the guiding principle of science that traditional beliefs are open to skeptical inquiry? Which of these two views rests on authority, perhaps not of the Bible, but of a textbook and its most literal interpreters of the textbook? Which of these two has created a fundamental conflict. Which of these two views uses evidence and logical deduction is forever uncertain? Which of these two views says there are irrefutable facts put in print that cannot be refuted by tomorrow's experiments? Which of these two views encourages skepticism, questioning, independent thought, and the use of reason? Which of these two views seeks, to, seeks chinks in the armor of established ideas? And which of these two views absolutely defends the armor from any attack and says it's established, it cannot be questioned. Which of these views is tentative? Which of these questions belief in authority? 
Which of these views is anti-science? That's the bombshell. That's the event that has turned the tables. Creation, science have, creation scientists have met decades-old challenges to creationism, exceeded those challenges, put testable predictions in print, have fulfilled those predictions, have made more predictions, are continuing to test those predictions. And evolutionists have responded, to my great surprise, in a religious manner. And I'm not saying they're religious. I'm saying they have defined religion by being, they have defined religion by saying it's not open to skeptical inquiry and all these other things I just read to you. They're behaving in the exact manner that they've accused creation scientists of behaving for years. So we've come full circle. The creationists are engaging in skeptical inquiry. Everything I've just mentioned to you, that's what the creationists are doing, and the evolutionists now are sitting in the seat where creationists supposedly once sat. Completely traded spots. This is, this is revolutionary. And again, it's a gift. It's an unforced error. I've published my book. The evolutionists could have taken those predictions and tested them, and instead, they've responded in a religious way. And this is not some obscure corner of the internet. These are the leading people responding to this leading work of creation science. This defines the creation evolution debate. Massive. There's more arguments that they've put in print. That was, that was again, that was the big problem Cardinal mentioned. And there's other points we'll eventually get to. I'll tell you where you can find the refutations here in a minute. But this is the book we've been discussing. It came out March of 2022. It fulfills predictions made in this book, replacing Darwin. This deals with the wider question of the origin of species. This, again, is written for someone who's skeptical of evolution. If you're not, if you hold a creation science, excuse me, this is written for someone who's skeptical of creation science and thinks evolution is true. I, I, I wrote it for skeptics of the Bible, essentially. But if you believe the Bible, you know, there's a lot you can learn from this. I, but I have made a Cliff Notes version where I do have primarily a Christian audience in mind. I've referenced this video series multiple times. This concludes this video series, at least the section that we're looking at the backstory to trace. We'll probably have some videos in the future as we talk about research that's ongoing. There's been some really exciting stuff that's happened within the last year since the book came out, and, and stay tuned for that. But in terms of responding to the critics, this is the uh, other, other video series that was in 2020, in terms of responding to the critics, you can go to my YouTube channel, if you're looking at the screen and saying, what is that writing that's Arabic? I've created a YouTube channel, Nathaniel Jensen, for the purpose of putting all things traced-related videos. So because of, here's one thing to give you a preview of what's happened, what we'll eventually talk about what's happened last year. I've had hundreds of Muslims reach out to me, people in North Africa and in the Middle East, in the Arabian Peninsula, who are very interested in knowing who the true Arabs are, Who's related to Abraham? Who's related to Ishmael? Can they find a link to Muhammad? These are hot questions in the Middle East. And so we've put out Arabic language videos for them. I'm going to have English language videos that give more detailed responses to the critics forthcoming. So if, if you're wanting more of this type of content, you can go there. The other channel that I mentioned, the other, the Answers in Genesis YouTube page, will be places where we can probably do big announcements as it relates to We've, we've made a significant advance, and one of the things we'll be talking about here in the future is tremendous progress in understanding the pre-Columbian history of the Americas, a topic near and dear to my heart. I've had a number of natives respond to me. They've also been wondering about this question, and there's been some spectacular dots that have been connected, even within the last few months that I haven't told you about yet. So stay tuned there, and again, if you want detailed responses to the critics, perhaps some more technical detail, this is the place to go. I've also got a blog that I'll probably use occasionally when, when criticisms come up that perhaps aren't even worth something big in public, but some obscure guy says something people ask, and so I'll respond there. To stay in touch with me, to, to keep up with news as it happens, I've created accounts on several social media sites, just because I don't know which one I'm going to be locked out of or kicked off of. But this is a place to correspond. That's probably the first purpose. But secondly, a place to just know when things happen. Hey, I've published a new video. I've published a new article. I've 
uh, something big is coming down the pike. I've done an interview. That's, that's the second purpose of these places. So, The Quiet Revolution, how young earth science is pushing back four decades of criticism. It's an audacious thesis. But I hope what you've seen in the past 45 minutes, 40 minutes, whatever it is, is enough to make you chew on this and say, yeah, we are at a new era, the dawn of a new era in creation science. Young earth science has made tremendous strides and in response, the evolutionary community has gifted creation science in unforced error, has turned the tables to put creation science in the driver's seat. Thanks so much for watching, for joining us. I hope you'll stay tuned. Like I said, this is ongoing research, so there's more to come in the future. I know there's going to be at least one more coming in the future because of the, the tremendous progress in the pre-Columbian Americas. And I don't know what else, because it's research, we don't know what's going to happen, but that's what makes it so exciting. See you again soon.